The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. If you weren't here last Sunday, you're probably wondering, why are Pastor Chad and Mark sitting on the job? <laughs> well, we have an explanation. We have a basket here in front of us, and last week we handed out blank sheets uh, that had some specific directions. As many of you know, we are moving closer and closer to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which we'll be celebrating on Reformation Sunday, the last Sunday in October. We historically understand the church, the Lutheran church, has a church of word and sacrament. And so we issued an invitation to you last week to write any question that pertained to word or sacrament, namely the word as we hear it read to us from our lectionary every week, uh, also the word as it's preached to us uh, by Pastor Chad and myself, but then also uh, sacrament, our two sacraments of holy baptism, which uh, amazingly we have today. So we get to witness that again and celebrate baptism and communion. It is a very good day, isn't it, Pastor mm -hmm. Chad? We get to celebrate both sacraments. Uh, and so questions about those two. So four questions. We read through a large stack of the questions, and uh, we put them in a basket here, and uh, we are going to respond to just six at this service. We had six the first. We've uh, set those aside. We're uh, going to address two new six sets questions today at this service and at the next service another set of six so uh, Pastor Chad and I don't know which questions we're going to answer uh, but uh, are you game to be the first one Pastor Chad? Might as well. Okay here we go. Does he look excited about this? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Alright Pastor Chad uh, this is about the prophetic word Pastor Chad the prophetic word um, it's a very important question is this the year that the Minnesota Vikings win the Super Bowl? No. Pardon me? No. Oh. All right, let's take another question. <laughs> Not next year either. Not next year. I, I almost forgot. I need someone who has a timepiece that measures uh, the, the seconds. You're ready to do that? All right. All right. Uh, so uh, start once he actually begins talking. We're going to allow two minutes per question. That way we won't keep you past your lunchtime. All right, so here's another question, Pastor Chad. All right, how is baptism for Lutherans distinctive compared to baptismal practices of other Christian faiths? Sure, I, I actually have some experience in this. I was baptized in the Baptist tradition at 11 years old before becoming a Lutheran in college. Um, and it really comes down to uh, the understanding of, of what baptism, uh, uh, what the role of baptism is in our lives. Uh, for us as Lutherans, it's a sign of 
God's, uh, God's grace and God's gift coming to us um, without anything we have to do to, to earn it. It's simply a gift that God gives us, a uh, um, mixture of water and word uh, in baptism to, to give us forga- forgiveness and, uh, and salvation. Um, other traditions, uh, like, like Baptist, would say that it's, it's something that a person does as an, as an outward sign of their faith, kind of like, kind of like a, um, a wedding might be, uh, just a, a public com- uh, statement of, uh, of a fact that's already, that's already true, that the two love each other. Um, so Baptists would say that, um, that for them, baptism is simply a person who's already come to faith, um, going through a ritual act uh, to publicly proclaim their faith. Uh, we say there's uh, more to it than that, uh, that it's actually God's grace coming to us. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and say one, sit here, I guess, and say one's right or one's wrong, but uh, in the Lutheran tradition, it's the one, uh, for me at least, uh, that, that um, seems more in line with uh, the way I, I, I view God in the world. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Oh, I do? <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Um, we, we also say that, and this is in our, our Nicene Creed at least, that a person only needs to be baptized once. Um, others might, might do differently than that, but we say once a person is baptized, uh, it's, it's done. And so you may say, uh, um, if someone came up to me and say, hey, I baptized uh, my, my grandchild. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't know what got, got, got into me, but I just did it. So can we do it again? I'd say, no, you shouldn't do it again. Because once is enough. So, yeah. All right, Pastor Mark. Let's go with the silent hand wave. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. All right. Pastor Mark. Yes. Is the whole Bible included during the Sunday scripture readings throughout the three-year cycle or only portions? That's a good question. Uh, you may have noticed if you've uh, been a Lutheran for any amount of time that we have readings from the Old Testament, we have readings from Paul's letters, the epistles, and then we have the gospel reading. This is part of what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, uh, which was uh, most recently put together in 1994. So we've been using that now for about 23 years. There was a lectionary before that, but this is the most recent one. So the lessons that we have were chosen. The formatting of this has been in existence a long time. And Protestant churches use this across the board. So it's not just Lutherans. A lot of Protestants use this. And Roman Catholics also use a lectionary as well. There's uh, it's very similar, maybe a week off or so than ours, but very, very close. So throughout the Christian church and among Protestants, you'll find the lectionary used. Uh, we have taken the primary texts that, that seem to be most appropriate in worship. So we're not going to read the whole Old Testament, the whole Old New Testament. Uh, we would have to have many, many more cycles to accomplish that. But we lift up those that seem to be most pertinent or relevant to the specific seasons of the church year. Uh, so we have the Old Testament to, again, give us a foundation for our origins, our beginnings, where we came from, where we're going. That tells the story of why we have brokenness and sin in this world, why God promised the Messiah, and now in the New Testament, why there is a Messiah, what he has done. And then Paul talks so often about uh, the church and its mission. So we have the best of all three uh, in the reading. Every week it's different, but it's usually the year of Matthew, Mark, or Luke, for the Gospels, and then John is used throughout all three, and a lot of with Mark, because that's the shortest of the Gospels. Do I have a little more time? 16 seconds. 16 seconds, all right. Uh, so every third year, we'll repeat back to that first setting. Uh, so the lessons you're hearing this year, you'll hear again in three years. Okay. Pastor Chad, why do we have Holy Communion every Sunday? I love communion, just wondering why. I'm glad whoever wrote that question loves communion. (laughs) Um, So you may have noticed that uh, we had a subtle shift in our worship uh, sometime in the winter where we started communing not just every other week, but but every week. Uh, That was um, a decision made by uh, by the pastors and by the uh, worship and music committee um, and, and the council and everything. Um, and that's really uh, going to a, a, a schedule like this where we commune at all services every Sunday is more in line with, uh, with the worldwide church uh, throughout history. Uh, if you were to go to a Catholic church um, in America or to any Protestant church really uh, overseas, you would have communion every single Sunday. Um, Lutherans have been celebrating it that way um, since the very beginning of the Reformation 500 years ago. Um, 
because uh, for, for Christianity for 2,000 years, has been in, uh, communion has been an integral part of the Sunday morning worship. Now, we, we lost that in America, um, particularly because of, um, because of the way that uh, Europeans immigrated to, to this country. Uh, there were more, there were more uh, lay people than, than clergy, really. And so uh, a, a congregation may be without a pastor for a couple weeks. And so pastors and bishops would make their rounds to all the congregations as, um, as the church was growing in, in America. And so a congregation may only get to, to commune once a month or once uh, four times a year or something. And we just kind of got used to it. Um, and so by, by doing um, every week, by going to this, we're, we're becoming part of a movement within the Lutheran church to, um, to remember our roots as, as Lutheran people and, um, and do what, uh, what's always been done. So. Um, really, because you, would, uh, you wouldn't go a day without eating. So um, you wouldn't go a week either without uh, receiving um, a meal here at, car- at church. So. And every time you come to worship, regardless of when you come, you'll receive communion. It's a really nice benefit. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Pastor Mark, who can preach and administer the sacraments? What resources are used in preaching the word? Really what we're talking about is this, this very special relationship between clergy and laity uh, and the whole church. Um, We're talking about a lot of history here, and early on as the church was formed, uh, the church understood the role of clergy, Uh, and the role of clergy is to shepherd. The word pastor means to shepherd, and so we are here to be a shepherd with you, not over you, but with you. And so we are shepherding alongside with you. The call of clergy is to spend a certain amount of time set aside for training, for education, uh, to be steeped in all the uh, traditions and, and the biblical practices and, and all the studies so that when we come to you, uh, we understand what it is that we, as Lutherans, historically, how we have understood the sacraments, baptism and communion. We use a creed, a historical creed, every Sunday, either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. We have things in place so that we don't lose sense of who we are historically, what we've been about. The early church had a lot of struggles early on about what it meant to be a Christian and who was going to do what. So this sets the stage really that when you call a pastor you know that we as pastors have been trained and we have been schooled and we have been practiced in the, the administration of the sacraments and of preaching. Uh, and So what we bring to you as, as trained clergy uh, is a continuity of the church historic and the church present. So uh, you'll find that wherever you go in the Lutheran Church. What we do to prepare for preaching Again, uh, each of our years in seminary, we have uh, a class each year in preaching, in homiletics it's called, and we will, we will uh, write sermons, we'll have them evaluated, we'll preach them with other students. We have a year of internship as well in there, where again, the supervising pastor helps with the intern and, uh, and theirs. But we read commentaries, we, we read through the scriptures, we pray through them, we have at our, disposable, at our disposal the, uh, the Greek and the Hebrew original languages, uh, but there's a lot there. And then we practice a, uh, uh, a certain amount of, of, of discernment throughout the week. Pastor Chad and I will start early in the week. We'll look at the text. We'll pray through them. I'm going to just take 30 seconds extra because yeah, it's, it's a big, big question. Yeah. And, uh, but we, we, we pray through these texts. Uh, we think about them, and they're never written in a day. In fact, we find that getting up here to preach... We may have notes, but you may not get everything that's on there, or you may get a whole lot more. Preaching is really, and I'm passionate about this, what we prepare to do is to stand up here and to invite the Spirit into that proclamation. All right? It's not the words we write that matter. It's that we are standing here, we've invited the Spirit all week long into our preparation, our thoughts, and our prayers. And then when we stand here before you, Chad and I seek to be open to the Spirit to share what's on the Spirit's mind as well as ours. And so we never quite know what we're going to say. We have an outline, but we're never quite sure what we're going to say or how we're going to say it. And we get three services to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we just don't, do we, Chad? No, sometimes we just don't. <laughs> we're still working on it. But, but uh, 
You know, I, I look back at those early years of preaching and I think, boy, that must have, those must have been patient congregations that, that, uh, <laughs> that walked with us in our, in our early preaching. So thank you for the extra time. Yeah, sure. All right. That means you get 10 seconds now, Chad. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> I believe in myself. Is this a yes or no question? We'll see. All right. Pastor Chad, explain the dichotomy or the difference between law and gospel. All right, yeah, I, get, I need more than 10, ten seconds. Okay, for this one. all right. All right, so law and gospel is more than just Old Testament and New Testament, um, which is traditionally how we might think of it. Uh, we say that the law is uh, what compels us um, to, to act a certain way, and the gospel is what frees us to, to live a certain way. Um, the, the law condemns, and the gospel uh, saves. So Jesus uh, spoke a lot of law, actually, um, in, in, the, um, in his preaching, especially in the, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 5 and around there. Um, a lot of his harder saying, harsher sayings are, are really sort of that law that should compel us to, to live a certain way. Um, and we know as, as uh, um, broken people that we can never uh, fulfill everything perfectly. We're never going um, to follow God's law perfectly in our lives. And that's why we have the gospel to free us from that burden of worrying about being um, meticulously perfect in our, in our faith and knowing that no, no matter what we do, God's never going to um, stop loving us. And God will always love us no matter uh, how, mu- how badly we mess up and how badly we, we break um, God's laws, that we have this gospel that will always uh, give us freedom and hope and salvation. So, um, and there's, there's gospel in the Old Testament too, so it's, it's kind of all mixed up in there. So. Yeah. All right. Last question. Pastor Mark, is Holy Communion truly the body and blood of Christ, and how does it happen? Good question. Good question. And those of you who went through confirmation, you remember some of the answers, of course, that come out of our our catechism studies. We, as Lutherans, say that Jesus is truly present, and that Jesus is present in this meal in, with, and under the elements or the sacraments. So in other words, We believe that Jesus, the spirit and the presence of Jesus, is real. He truly is present, just as he is present when we gather to worship, where two or three are gathered there am I uh, in the midst of you. Uh, Jesus is present uh, at the baptism. But in this meal, as we uh, lift up uh, the bread and the wine, we confess that Jesus is present in, with, and under the elements. This is different than other a couple other ways of looking at it, not, not the way we practice it, but uh, in, some, uh, in some areas of Christianity, they would, they would hold up the meal and say, this is symbolic of Jesus, but don't really proclaim his presence. That's different from how we do it. Um, others, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, would, uh, would say, uh, using the, the doctrine of transubstantiation, in other words, the change of substance, that in the bread and the wine, um, even though they continue to look like bread and wine, uh, that they are somehow changed by God into the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, that's another way of looking at it. Ours we would call consubstantiation. It is uh, believing that Jesus is with, in, and under the elements, but truly, truly present. And so we trust that his spirit uh, is with us in worship. Uh, was there another part of that question? Um, and how does it happen? How does it happen? <laughs> Can I defer to the mystery of God? Yes. I will defer to the mystery of God. Um, it's better than what I would have done. You know, that there's, there's, I'll just put it this way. Jesus promises to do it, and that's good enough for us. Jesus promises that the water of baptism, that the Spirit is poured out upon us, that we are forgiven of our sins and we are given the gift of eternal life. God promises through Christ that here at this meal, as we eat his body and blood, that Jesus is present because he's promised to be here. He's commanded us to do both of these sacraments. He has promised to be with us till the end of the age. Lo, I go with you always. So Jesus has given us a promise. When you think about it, this whole venture of Christian faith is trusting the promise, isn't it? It's not dependent on our reason. It's not dependent on proof. It's dependent on a promise God gives to us in Christ, and it's dependent on your faith in the one who makes the promise. Shall we pray? (laughs) Let's pray together. Lord, we give thanks for these uh, 
important and probing questions. There are so many questions on our hearts, and we don't always get the chance to ask those questions. We thank you for this congregation that continues to be curious, continues to seek to know your will, to understand what it is we do and why we do it. Lord, thank you for this relationship that Pastor Chad and Pastor Chuck and I have with this congregation. We pray that there would always be a spirit of curiosity, of dialogue, uh, of mutual sharing, and of walking together in the spirit. Bless us for this work always of this dialogue, this trust, and our trust above all in the one who makes the promise, in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.